Welcome to my Commodore 64 Games Memories. This is where I look at old games and some of the technical details behind them. Let's get into it. Today we have Buggy Boy, published in 1987 by Elite, copyright Kato, and I think that's the original arcade manufacturer or publisher, coded by Dave Thomas, and graphics are by Bob Thomas, and I think the music is by Dave Thomas. At least that's what I'm reading here on the credits. So I'm going to be looking at the disc version. Now the disc version with the files on here, I'm just using a few of my tools. So first of all I'm looking for unused files or hidden files or deleted files in the, on the disc. These zero length files I can get rid of. Now I updated the recover command in my version of C1541 to only recover files which are not in the normal directory. So all of these files or fragments of files exist on the drive to some extent. Basically a block has a valid track and sector link, apparently files which are less than 254 bytes long will have a zero byte in the track and then some length. We can see here in the disk directory structure that immediately the disk is protected by power, para, protect, sorry. I'm going to put a link into the C64 disk preservation website which details a little bit more about para protect and which games it's used in. I also seem to remember doing a previous video where I look at some in extreme detail what the ParaProtect loader does and it is obfuscated really quite well. So I'm not going to spend too much time on the ParaProtect auto run for this game. I'm just going to do a little initial investigation just to see if it's kind of like the same code because the games were released at two different times just to satisfy my curiosity. All of those short little files which were recovered from the disk didn't seem to contain much information. I'm going to have a look at the disk image with the G64.conv program just to see if there's any weird data in there. It doesn't look like it's unusual that there's track 40 sector 14, so that's track 40, sector 14. Kind of expect that on the disc with extra protection, you kind of expect to see extra tracks, but nothing too unusual immediately jumps out at me anyway. So I just want to try and have a look at the files that we can actually see on the directory on the disk. These are the files that the Commodore 64 would expect to be able to load. There aren't that many and these three files are all the same length which tells me that they all probably contain the same data. This is not unusual in, in Commodore 64 disks. Often there are especially protected disks, often there are multiple entries which point to the same chain of blocks on the disk. So basically you get the same file data out at the end of it. We can see here that initially that the file loads at AE all the way down in zero page. This is very near the start of memory. We can see that we have what looks like a basic sys2112 command and I saw a very similar thing in the previous para protect game. The previous Para Protect game was actually Last Ninja, the disc version. This Para Protect auto run loader was very obfuscated in Last Ninja. It was rewriting very low down zero page locations to change the address that it was loading data to and it if I remember correctly, it did that at least twice, maybe even three times. It was also loading code, 
way down in zero page, that it would, after a while, start executing and update the stop vector and all that kind of incredibly funny obfuscation. If I remember, it started issuing uh, serial disk serial command uh, calls to the kernel even during its load. So it was very well obfuscated. It it hid really quite well the code that it was wanting to execute, and it also had some descrambling in there as well and stuff like that. Modern emulation tools and debugging that we have in these applications now make it much more obvious what the code execution path was doing back in the old days. It would have been extremely difficult without a memory debugging unit to, to be able to find out exactly what the code was doing. If we just put a breakpoint in a whole range of lower memory we can see that it starts executing some of the code. However, that doesn't really tell the full story about the complexities of this para-protect auto-run file. The code that we start seeing executing at 2ED, actually there is code earlier on and lower down in zero page that executes before then, which is really quite cool. I'm going to put a link to the last ninja video so you can see in greater detail all of the very long and I wouldn't say tedious but a detailed examination of the Paraprotect auto run. At the moment I'm just satisfying my curiosity. In the standard C64 kernel ROM it actually puts a little routine down in lower zero page, down in 73, which is called charget. I've labelled it ZP charget for zero page charget, but basically it copies this from the ROM and puts it down into zero page. This routine is in zero page because it makes, uh, if I remember rightly, it makes use of the slightly faster execution of code in zero page due to self-modification, I think. Putting the charget routine also like this allows it to be customized because in ROM there, there's no opportunity to modify it because ROM is read-only. If you put it into zero page in RAM then it's easier to modify. We can see here that some of the code that's loaded as part of this para-protect auto run file starts executing code that it has loaded into what is usually used as the screen line link routine. So we can see here it ED, it starts executing code, and this little code here does a check to see how far along it's got loading. And then once it's got so far through the loading, it then uh, alters the stop vector to start executing different code as it is loading this code. This code here is executing as the kernel does its load which is really quite a special thing for it to do. It allows it to obfuscate even further exactly the data it is loading. We can see here that it looks like it's trying to do some kind of like stack slide, and I think I go through the stack slide and how it works in the last Ninja Power Protect, but basically it fills the whole processor stack between 100 to 1FF in hex with the value 02. A repeating value of 02, you can see that in the memory view there. It's called the jam instruction, but basically it's 02 in hex. It fills the whole stack with that in the hope that it will return from a subroutine somewhere and then pull these new values off the stack and then jump to that code, which would have been at 0203, if I remember rightly. But yeah, this, this is all looking very familiar now. And it basically looks like a very similar kind of para-protect auto-run that I was seeing in Last Ninja really quite well obfuscated. I do like how this was working. It does not really work that well with any kind of uh, accelerated um, 
disk disk loading acceleration or anything like that if it's if it's a kernel ROM replacement if that works in a different way which it would kind of do so even if you can read some of the data in here some of the other data is scrambled and some of the other data is not easy to pull out just by examining the file so the file data is loaded differently which is uh, great from this protection point of view anyway I don't think we'll be spending too much more detail in this I think as I say I'll put a link to the last ninja video and then uh, you can see all of the detail that I go into with the power protect code I will add a few little pieces of extra information in this buggy boy text file which I'm going to be checking into the debugging details repository on, on the github and I'll also put a link to that as well so you can see a little bit more of the details when I was just running through this but uh, I don't think we'll, we'll go into the whole lot of detail in this video so bear with me while I uh, cut ahead for a little while so just one little thing to note is that when the power protect code starts running you can see it fills the whole memory with this repeating pattern. I think it fills the whole memory with the repeating pattern to try and stop freezer cartridges coming along and compressing everything. I think it fills the memory to try and make it a lot more difficult to make an efficient freezer cartridge freeze of the, of the entire game at a certain point. It also probably fills the memory to try and defeat any kind of code which is hanging around and claiming some kind of vector that the loader doesn't really understand or know about perhaps but basically at this point I'm trying to trace through to before the memory clear just to really validate that the power protect code is approximately similar to the stuff that I've been seeing in last ninja and at this point I'm thinking that yes it is very extremely similar so I'm going to zoom ahead a little bit and, and not really describe what's going on here in too much detail. We can see here at this point once the power protect code has really started properly running it starts using the output byte on serial bus calls into the kernel directly and that's the code at 33c that we can see there in the debugger. It also sends an unlisten on the serial bus and it is sending the four serial bytes at 3ed going backwards in memory and if we have a look at those bytes in memory at 3ed we can see it's m-e followed by two other bytes sorry it sends five bytes not four and m-e is obviously the memory execute command for mem executing what is in the drive's memory at uh, 205 on the drive side and this is where the power protect code starts running drive code so putting a breakpoint at 200 to 800 in hex on the drive and then continuing shows us that the drive starts running drive code at 205 in hex, which is what we thought after the Paraprotect Auto Run was running, or it was executing its memory execute command. So that's not a surprise. We can see it's starting to do uh, standard job codes. It does a CLI, it doesn't use the drive's ROM routine for doing the CLI and turning on the LED itself. It, it does that itself, it just basically enables the interrupt by clearing the interrupt enable flag or interrupt disable flag, sorry and then it allows the timer on the drive code to start running the job processing functionality which reads from these very low zero page locations in the drive to then load and or ex or to read and or execute code from certain blocks in the drive's memory. We can see as the Commodore 64 on the left hand side here is running its code, we can see it's doing a check with D012 which is again trying to synchronize the drive serial read or writes with the raster beam to try and avoid bad lines. Which is intriguing actually because I think the screen is turned off at this point. But okay, later on I think the loading screen uh, is 
enabled while it's doing a load on this disk version, so that's probably why it's doing the raster check. We can see that the Commodore 64 is doing not very optimized serial access here, but you know, to be honest, the serial access doesn't have to be extremely optimized to be quick, because most of the time is actually taken up with the drive processing and the actual sending of the data itself is sometimes somewhat secondary to the actual speed of the loader. You don't have to be completely cycle accurate. Some of the time is taken up by waiting to avoid the bad line on the, on the C64's screen display, for example. Don't forget that with the Commodore 64's VIC chip, its video generation chip, every eight lines there is a bad line and that's when the VIC chip, the video chip, will fetch extra memory from RAM for the color memory for the character uh, definitions and stuff like that. Or which characters to display at which screen line. Now because each character is eight pixels high, generally, unless you squish the, the character pixel rows, then it will fetch extra memory every eight pixels as it goes down the screen. And, and this basically kind of like pauses or stuns the Commodore 64 CPU. So to be honest, when you're trying to do tightly timed serial routines, and these are relatively tightly timed, you want to avoid those what we call bad lines where the processor is stunned and not able to process any information. So the drive doesn't have bad lines, of course. So you want to try and synchronize your C64 code with the drive code while avoiding those bad lines on the Commodore 64 side. That's why it does synchronization with D012. I noticed in the memory view, actually, when it's doing loading, we've got these little uh, green sparkles dotted around through the memory, these green sparkles tend to indicate that it's doing at least a read at those, they're not random memory locations, but they're quite sparse memory locations. The actual writes from the, from the load, you could see were being written in sequence with those yellow writes going down the, the memory view page. It's these compares with indirect uh, zero page address comma x close bracket the indirected indirected comma x addressing mode is really quite uh, an unusual addressing mode it's not used very often the the comma y indirect mode is often used because y is an index which is added on to the indirected address whereas with x the value that is in x is actually added to the zero page address that you're loading from before it figures out the address. So that kind of explains why we're seeing those green sparkles on the memory view is that it's doing a compare and it's actually self modifying the zero page address used for that compare. So actually it's doing some sparse readbacks with the compare but it seems to be throwing away that result from the compare it doesn't seem to be important for the load maybe it's important for timing points of view but it doesn't seem in in in, in my initial analysis to be actually using the result of that compare which is weird but okay no problem don't worry about it um it's actually lucky from the code's point of view that they are not accidentally doing superfluous reads from uh, the VIC interrupt control registers or the CIA, the complex interface adapter chips and its registers. Sometimes superfluous reads may or may not acknowledge an interrupt, say for example, and then cause another interrupt to happen. So yeah, maybe it's unusual. Maybe or maybe it's just lucky. It's certainly unusual. Um, it looks like it's uh, a wasted opcode, to be honest. But hey ho, never mind. So once all of the loading has finished, it seems to jump to eight zero one, and maybe this is the start of the game code. 
there seems to be a few uh, weird instructions at the very beginning that there's a no op with a, an absolute comma x address and then there's a lax and which is load accumulator and x at the same time and a store a and then a bit and then another lax and then a store a and then finally 810 there's a set interrupt and then the usual load x with fftxs which is claiming all of the uh, stack address i wonder if they did get the start address wrong and did a typo between 801 and 810 uh, although it's certainly storing something in FA and FB in zero page, upon initial examination it doesn't seem to be actually reading back the information at FA and FB. Hmm. So maybe it did, maybe it didn't. Although the code here, after it's finished loading, um, it does seem to be... Uh, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to save the whole memory at this point. If you regularly watch my videos, you'll know that I, seem, I, I, I do like to save out the whole of memory after I think it's finished its load, with a view to perhaps compressing the uh, whole of memory that's been dumped out, basically, and then seeing if I can then load it back again to produce a standalone version of the game without its protection. So when I say the whole of memory, I mean something, uh, the whole of memory after the stack, all the way up until the top of memory, that's why I'm saving 200 to FFFF. Now, looking at this initial code, yeah, the loading screen is displayed at this particular point in time, which means that the memory that I'm saving would, would probably have all of this loading screen superfluous data in there. Which is kind of like weird, but okay. Um, I don't really want to have all of that memory in there if I'm decompressing, but hey, never mind. So anyway, this, this initial code that it's trying to run here at 801 seems to be, uh, there's some initial relocation and then it seems to be doing some decompression or at least a large amount of memory moving around. You can see it's shuffled around a whole bunch of memory and then it's doing a uh, start to end what looks like decompression. The screen is off at this point now, which helps to speed up the processor because it's not being stunned or paused for the bad lines. It then does another sweep through, mem through memory, which is probably a second decompression pass or a depack pass. And then it runs the game code. So there's at least two, maybe three, passes through the memory after it's loaded before the game actually starts running proper. I think I want to, at some point, probably trap out the rest of those code executions and see what changes in the memory. Now, anyway, we can see here that there are sprites in the second VicBank and also some sprite definitions in the third VicBank, but those are in the middle of what looks like a whole bunch of data or code. It doesn't look like graphics data in the third bank. It just looks like some sprite frames. And we'll probably expect to see those sprite frames being dynamically copied into the second Vic bank, which is at 4000 in hex. If I start looking for the text screens that are being used, and also bitmaps, just in case, uh, there's a character set there, okay. There's another one that looks like some parts of a character set in the third bank, but I don't think they're going to be used for displaying video. I think they're probably going to be copied. So we can see that the second screen, in other words, the screen starting at 4400 in the second Vic bank at 4000 in hex, contains the screen data. We can see that the character set is at 6800 at least, 6800 in hex, sorry, at least um, for the title screen. We can see here that the, uh, huh. now this is interesting, you'll notice that there is a road being displayed in the bottom part of the screen. The red and white bars are jumping up and down a little bit, which tells me, ah, look, in the bitmaps, <laughs> 
Okay, so the road is actually plotted with a bitmap, but the mountains and the clouds and the score panel up, up at the top half of the screen are using characters. Aha! Uh -huh. And the mountains and the clouds are actually smooth scrolled using a hardware smooth pixel offset scrolling, and then the character screen is being scrolled as you would normally expect. But look, wow! No wonder the no wonder the road routine was really quite smooth in Buggy Boy then. It's using the bitmap, but it's using a multicolored bitmap, as we can see, because the middle of the road is using that vertical stripy pattern, which basically tells us that it's using. Uh, the multicolor bitmap mode and we can see that it's got black pixels for transparent pixels and that's where the background screen color comes through. Interesting to note that when it goes back to the title screen and also this game level start screen the bitmap from the previous game is still there in memory so it's not being used by anything else. Uh, we can probably surmise from this that basically the rest of the road objects that you can see, including the buggy and the flags and the lampposts and the logs or whatever, and the boulders, they are all sprites. Quite impressive really, isn't it? It's a good way of doing it. Uh, the tunnel walls and the ceiling seem to be drawn into the bitmap, but also, if you, if you noticed, it's drawn into the character screen, so there aren't well, there don't seem to be any sprites for the tunnel uh, walls and the ceiling. It's just character and bitmap updates. I think what we'll do is, is that we'll actually uh, use the C64 debugger for this. So the memory view in ICU um, didn't really show us much. So, I mean, there, there didn't seem to be anything else superfluous or, or you know like any hidden messages or anything like that in the memory view so if we have a look at c64 debugger and we'll have a look at we'll we'll just double check to see what are sprites on the screen because the c64 debugger has this really cool uh, red box around all of the sprites that it's rendering right in the, in the vic debugging mode so we'll use that to our advantage So uh, bear with me for a while. This is just the loading screen. We know that the game is going through two or maybe even three passes of the memory while it's depacking, de crunching, de linking, whatever you want to call it. Here we go. The attract sequence, the level start screen. And wow, look at that. Yes, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 11, 12 sprites, 13, 14. So there's definitely some multiplexing going on. And it's using an array of differently scaled X and scaled Y and sometimes X and Y together. Look at that. Sprites all bolted together for all of the game objects. That's fantastic, isn't it? So yeah, this is why... So this game, when when I got it originally, I, I was very impressed with how smoothly everything moved. Now, you know, generally, technically speaking, games of this era, and you know, things like Turbo Charge, for example, or Power Drift, they would use character screens and they would use a whole bunch of character graphics. Now, the character graphics allow for larger game objects but less smoothly animated or moved as they go across the screen. By using sprites and expanded sprites in this way, the sprites have a much finer resolution of being able to move around the screen rather than the character graphics. And of course using a bitmap allows the road to be nice and smoothly curved. But Updating a bitmap is very time. Uh, is very uh, expensive in terms of time, right? Because you're having to update a lot more data because the bitmap screen requires a lot more data. So, this is why I think that Buggy Boy doesn't have an up-down 
view change. It keeps tight control over precisely the amount of road it needs to render by not moving the horizon up and down so it doesn't cause too much variation in the frame rate, which is fair enough. It's a trade-off, right? If you want a nice, smooth-looking road, then you're going to have to pay for it in other ways, and that's usually by reducing the amount of screen space that you have to update. But, you know, I was struck when I got this game by how smoothly things move, and now you can definitely see how smoothly things move, because we know now that it's it's using some nicely multiplex sprites with hardware X and Y scaling. So I'm just adding some notes now to the debugging notes file so that if you have a look later on you can see uh, like, like we've just seen in this video the findings. Uh, lots of typing going on here, just bear with me for a second. Or more like a minute, to be honest. Just want to make sure that my thoughts are all accurately noted down. So here we're going to go back to the loading, and I'm putting a breakpoint here at 801, which is where the loading was finished and it was just about to start running the game code. I'm going to save all of the RAM from 200 to FF. FF, and I'm going to call that buggy boy uh, 1 at 801, the start address, because I'm anticipating that we're going to go through this a few times, and I'm looking for the optimal point at which I can save all of the memory, but avoid all of this extra decompression that the game is doing. So it goes through one whole pass, and you can see there, even in, even in warp mode, the memory view flickers quite significantly, and it's running a whole bunch of other code now, which does a whole bunch, bunch of backwards movement and then more either depacking or block moving around. So it's doing a copy back from back to front, from the end to the start of memory, and basically And I'm saving that now as, as the second chunk, so Buggy Boy 2, also starting at 801. And then w once it starts running the code at uh, 100 in hex, which is uh, the start of the stack. So obviously it's hidden some code at the start of the stack. We're having a look to see what it does, and it's doing a whole bunch of rotates and things like that. Maybe, maybe not, maybe it's doing a some bit extractions, maybe it's doing uh, either descrambling or maybe some LZW decompression or something like that. Possible. Uh, it seems to be then jumping to more code, which does a whole bunch of extra stuff. And then it does some. Oh, it does some initialization there with the process support at three seven. It resets what looks like the CIA 1 and 2 uh, interrupt control registers, sets up some VIC stuff, and it look, then it does a jump to 800. Oh. That's interesting. Okay. So maybe I can save this as um, file number three and then save it out as start address 800 then. This looks like the start of the game. The stack, I um, it's not the stack, sorry. The 0, 0 and 0, 1 memory addresses are set up strangely as FF in 6A, uh, as opposed to the default, more default values as you would normally expect. That's something to note later on. But then if I let the code run, yeah, then it goes straight into the games attract sequence. So yeah, I think that's the real start of the game code, which is at 800. 
So yes, let's try co uh, compressing that Buggy Boy 3 starting at 800 code with the correct starter address at $800 this time. Running that, let's see what we get. Hmm. So we get the title screen displayed and there we go, we've got what looks like the attract mode starting. But it is not responding to me pressing the fire button on the joystick. That's interesting. I wonder why it's doing that. So at this point I'm suspecting that after decompression the code which starts at 800 wasn't quite starting cleanly and that's probably to do with the lower zero page state. So I'm thinking that if I can find some spare memory in RAM, which I do have here, because we saw that there was the loading star and the ready message and stuff like that. So we'll put some extra tidy up code um, at the screen memory at 580 in hex. And what we'll do is that we'll stop the interrupts. We'll uh, claim all of the stack. We won't use CLS because that's wrong. It's CLD for clearing the decimal mode. We will then clear the rest of zero page uh, memory, all to the same value. We're going to clear uh, zero 02 in hex, all the way up to FF in hex. And we'll clear that all to zero. Uh, actually, what I do need to do is that I need to also set up zero and zero 01 locations to be FF and what was it, 6A? Because that's what I noticed they were set to uh, as 800 was starting to execute. So we'll just restore those as well. Uh, a little bit of typing going on here. Uh, I want to load the accumulator with zero so then I can start using the accumulator to store into the zero page locations. The X register currently contains FF because that's what I loaded it as, as at 581 and then transferred it to the stack pointer. So we'll, you will just clear backwards. We don't want to overwrite what is in zero and zero one so we'll put a a comparison for that index there and we'll branch on the equal and then we'll jump to 800. We'll save that. Well, that's what the code looks like. Uh, sorry, wrong address. There we go. That's what the code looks like. Set interrupt, claim stack, clear decimal, set the processor port and its data direction register. Clear the rest of zero page jump to 800. We'll save that as a new file because we've been playing around with the memory we'll save it as a new file. Note new start address in hex of 580. We'll save the whole of memory basically. We'll then go 580 we'll see yeah we'll run the code now. Now we've saved it. We'll, we'll run the code. We'll see if it works. Always better to see if it works first rather than, you know, just spending time to, to run the compressed version on code that really doesn't work. Uh, there we go. Just going to do the jump. Got a breakpoint at jump as well. Hmm. That's disappointing. It's not starting. The attract sequence is not running. I wonder why that is. Okay, so we'll put a breakpoint at 580 and we will uh, run the compressed version. But before it starts running uh, this little tidying up code after it does my decompression, uh, what we can try now is that instead of jumping straight 800 at 596, we're going to assemble a little bit more code. Uh, I'm going to 
reset the processor port to 37 uh, default and jump no I'm gonna clear the interrupts as well I noticed that when the game was running initially at 800 I think the interrupts were cleared so that the interrupts would actually be running so then we'll jump to 800 and then if I let the code execute on then it works after all of the decompression so the decompression code does mess up a lot of the very low zero page and it messes up the interrupt well it disables the interrupt right? so uh, I think what we'll do uh, rerunning we just assemble I'm just going to try it with the CLI I'm going to jump let's see what yeah that just doesn't work does it okay so we'll do a I think what we'll have to do is that we'll have to add a little bit of extra process support initialization and then a CLI uh, and then we'll see what it does so 3.7 is the default uh, it, it enables the ROMs it clears the interrupt and then we'll jump to 800 and we'll see if that works yeah it does okay so we'll add that to uh, the code so let's load that partially modified yeah no there's a typo there I'm getting tired right uh, another typo Okay, let's try a third time, shall we? Third time lucky. Yeah, okay, so let's load that. And then uh, let's, yeah, there we go. And then let's uh, add in that extra code that we knew that kind of like worked. <laughs> this disassembly view, uh, resetting its address once you do a SC command is really annoying. Anyway, uh, disassembly. It, yeah, whatever. Um, so, assemble at 596, uh, the code that we tested before just now. So, reset the processor port back to normal. Da da da, do a CLI, then do a jump. <laughs> whatever. Um, save it as newly modified file name so buggy boy 5 code starting at 580 that looks correct yep okay good no yep go 580 and then bink bink boink it works okay so we'll compress that new version of the slightly updated code with the zero page clear and then we'll see if it runs right here we go bing 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 you can see the extra code there in screen memory as it's decompressing and yeah it works there we go a nice single file version of buggy boy with uh, the protection we can see that the code is still sitting there unmodified in screen memory so I'm going to add this extra piece of code that we needed to write and put it in the debugging details file just for completeness sake just to serve as a reminder about what needed to be added to tidy up after the decompression so there we go there is the relevant detail added to the debugging text file. And we'll really just double check that the game works. And yes, the game does work. No problem there, I don't think. Oh, it looks to be fine, right? I think so. Uh, there we go. 
So I think that we'll leave this video there. We can see that it's got a nice small file size, basically almost half the memory. So it's compressed really quite well. It's probably compressed all sorts of extra superfluous information, but hey ho, never mind. Although, to be honest, I think the game pretty much uses the whole of memory anyway, so I'm not too worried about the extra data. And that's the command line for the compression. So, if you like these kind of technical deep dive videos, then please do consider liking or subscribing to this channel. That would be wicked, great, fantastic, wonderful if you could do that. And if you want to add comments in the comment section below, then also please do so. I really love hearing from people with their views about the games and or what they liked, or especially if people have worked on these games and they have some extra insight, then I'm also really happy to hear back from them as well. So have a great day wherever you are.